Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cardiometabolic Beat, brought to you by the Cardiometabolic Health Congress. I am Shpatim Karandria, the Scientific Director for CMHC, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Robert Eckel, CMHC Chair, Co-President of the American Diabetes Association, and Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado in Aurora. Dr. Eckel is a renowned expert in diabetes, obesity, and much more, and today we'll discuss about the connections between obesity and COVID-19, as well as some updates on diabetes therapy in this setting. Dr. Eckel, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll start by asking, what do we know today about the connections between obesity and COVID-19, uh, both in the risk of infection and COVID-19 severity? Well, what we've learned about uh, obesity and COVID-19 is a much larger percentage of people in the hospital, particularly those who end up uh, on assisted ventilation, are obese. The New York City experience uh, recently published uh, identified around 50% of their hospitalized patients were obese, but the percentage is much higher in those who need assisted ventilation. So this is a concern. And the mechanisms for this probably are multifactorial, including maybe a more uh, comorbidity such as lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. Or alternatively, it could be related to obstructive sleep apnea and, and more chronic uh, lung disease that is secondary to their obesity. I'm not quite sure we have evidence that people with obesity are at higher risk to obtain uh, in COVID-19 infection. In other words, a large percentage of the population are asymptomatic with this uh, condition, whether obese patients uh, with uh, with infection are more likely uh, to have infection, or secondly, and I think it probably parallels diabetes, once infected, the obese patient is at greater risk for needing hospitalization and uh, the um, aspects of the care that follow. And could obesity be a factor in the death toll, particularly in the younger population? Well, this is uh, anecdotal, but I've heard uh, from uh, uh, an internist in New York City area who's been involved in a lot of COVID-19 uh, obesity interactions, and many of the people under the age of 50, obesity is the major risk factor that's contributing to their need for assisted ventilation. So, uh, yes, I think ob obesity is, is a concern, and I think age may be important. Of course, age is important for, for outcomes that are unfavorable, uh, across the board. In other words, people in their 70s and 80s seem to be the large percentage of people who have uh, death following their COVID-19 infection and hospitalization. But in terms of ICUs and ventil ventilated patients, I think we're uh, seeing a much higher percentage of obesity there, which I, I think may relate to the factors I mentioned earlier. Based on the connections we know now about obesity and COVID-19, what would be some implications for uh, frontline clinicians? The COVID-19 experience, uh, at least in the U.S., but I think globally, too, is identifying obesity as a risk factor for uh, for poor outcomes, or at least less favorable outcomes, including hospitalization, intubation, and death. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the uh, approach to patients with obesity in a clinic population who are outpatient, I think uh, there needs to be a, a higher level of concern about their ultimate uh, need for hospitalization and ultimately the course it may follow. So yes, I think there needs to be an increased awareness of obesity even in the absence of, of uh, known lung disease or diabetes uh, needs to be brought to the attention of primary care physicians, yes. And lastly, so much confusion already exists about diabetes medications in diabetes patients with COVID-19, particularly in the hospital setting with reports calling for discontinuation of some therapies, including insulin, SGLT2 inhibitors, or GLP-1 RAs. And based on what we know currently, what is the viewpoint with regards to diabetes therapy in patients who also have COVID-19? Well, I think just for your information, uh, I'm part of a paper that just came out in Lancet, uh, diabetes and endocrinology and diabetes, Lancet endocrinology and diabetes on COVID-19 and diabetes. So in that manuscript, we've recommended that SGLT2 inhibitors be discontinued uh, uh, at the time of hospitalization. Uh, metformin, a question mark there. I think management of hyperglycemia with insulin now is probably indicated, although this is not a randomized controlled trial, but there's a paper that's just been published in the journal 
of diabetes science and technology that indicates that poor glycemic control for patients with diabetes or with elevated glucose in the hospital are at higher risk for negative outcomes. Uh, so uh, that paper is worthy of attention. But uh, in terms of GLP-1 receptor agonists, I see no reason to be giving those to patients with diabetes in the hospital simply because those agents, uh, you know, are typically used for weight reduction and, and people uh, can have GI side effects. And I think the, the risk there uh, is, is uh, in general, people aren't very hungry, too, or sick. So I think the GLP-1 receptor mm-hmm. agonists have practical implications. But the SOT2 inhibitors uh, per se, because uh, ketoacidosis can develop in people without diabetes, not necessarily diabetic ketoacidosis, but they get ketosis, so they don't, that's typical of not eating well and being sick. But moreover, the SOT2 inhibitors can occasionally uh, result in DKA in patients with diabetes and perhaps even in these ketotic patients without diabetes. And those plasma glucoses are typically not very elevated. So that certainly raises another concern about that type of a u- utilization. I think sulfonylureas have to be used cautiously in preventing the risk of hy- hypoglycemia. And then I think the current data on ACE inhibitors and ARBs are, indicate they're not harmful in patients who are uh, hospitalized with uh, with COVID-19 infection. They should be continued in people who have good indications for them to begin with. I think hydroxychloroquine, when used, should be cautiously used because of the risk of hypoglycemia and cardiac arrhythmias. So that's a, another situation in diabetes which may uh, incur additional risk. So that, I think, uh, unfortunately, that those trials, many of them are just starting, but uh, many people are using uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in a setting in which they've uh, not been a- entered into a clinical trial. In other words, the patient's being treated. So um, that's a lot of information on drugs. But I think general in the hospital, if hyperglycemia is present, insulin infusion should be utilized. Uh, we're now seeing that CGM can be used on the floor, and, and in pe- people who use CGM, uh, outside of the hospital can bring their own CGM with them. The FDA has been much more lenient on the management of diabetes in the hospital setting. But there are practical issues from ma- related to finger stick measurements by uh, the healthcare profession that really should, uh, you know, I think move hospitals if they don't have CGM experience to have uh, CGM made available and learn the technology very quickly so they can avoid uh, undue exposure of uh, healthcare personnel within the hospital setting. So that's that's a long answer. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, but uh, this is really great info that puts into perspective a lot of the evidence that has come out recently on this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Eckel, for your time and expertise, and thanks to all of you for listening. If you have any questions or if you have any feedback on topics that you would like us to discuss in future episodes, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at info at cardiometabolichealth.org or through social media via Facebook at Cardi Metabolic Health, or via Twitter and Instagram at CMHC underscore CME. Thank you, and until next time.